so glad you came to be a part, or you're watching online and you're still a part, and that's amazing. Um, so why don't we, how about let's stand up, say hi to somebody around you, give them a high five, or we do fist bumps around here lately, right? All right, and let's, let's just, let's worship together this morning. Pastor Ben. Um, we would love to talk 
um, to you about what that means, um, who gets baptized, what child dedication really means. So um, again, if that is something that you're interested in or have questions about, please, please, please ask Pastor Phil, Susan, or Ben after service. And our next announcement is on the 18th. It is Men's Steak Night. So can I get a raise of hands? Who went to the first Men's Steak Night that we did? Yeah, we got a couple. And how was it? How was it? Yeah. So, yeah, we love Steak Night here at Alive Church. We just think that it is such a fun way to have fellowship um, with one another. Um, obviously, I will not be there, but the guys get together, and they just have um, steak, and they just talk, and they just um, talk about where they are in their lives, what's going on, um, talk about God, and it's just a really fun night of just good Christian fellowship with brothers in Christ. So that is 20 bucks for your ticket, and if you are going to invite a friend, it's only $10 for their ticket. So um, if you would like to get registered for that and save your steak, go ahead and talk to Chris Caban or Tony Perkins after service. Our last announcement is Trunk or Treat, and we are so excited. This is our third annual year of doing it, and it has been a blast every single year. We have had kids lining up, seriously, all the way around the block just to get in the loop of candy madness that we have going on in the parking lot. So if you are interested in being a part of that and decorating your trunk and putting it in the parking lot and can handing out candy, go ahead and sign up in the lobby you might have seen when you walked in. There's a table with sign-ups for your spot. Um, and if you want to be involved but you don't want to do a trunk, you don't want to get that involved, we also have candy donations. So we go through, believe it or not, about a thousand pieces of candy each year. It's crazy. We tell everybody to bring at least 500 pieces and we always run out. It's craziness. So if that's a way that you would like to support Trunk or Treat and uh, giving the dental community some nice new customers this fall, um, please drop off those candy bags in the uh, large bin in the front of the lobby. And we are going to uh, watch our kids spot now. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Joseph Jadlowski. I am an inventor. You might be familiar with some of my inventions I have created over the years. One, for example, is the fun and exciting game for teenagers, Box of Glass. And the other is the very exciting and fun Pet Lock. And the one I am working on currently is the turtle pen. It is not just a turtle, but yet it is a writing utensil. As you see, we have created many things, but all inventors, they are not afraid to ask questions. Even if that question might sound kind of silly, could a turtle be a pen? Uh, could a lock be a pet? You see, what I derive my inspiration for asking questions comes directly from God's Word. And it comes from this passage, quite possibly the greatest passage that God has given us in His Word. We find this meeting. This meeting is with Jesus and a man named Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus is a very long word, so we will shorten it to Nick. And so Jesus and Nick have this encounter uh, at night, and uh, Nick says something like, we know that you are from God because of the miracles you perform. And before he could even ask a question, Jesus makes this statement. Jesus replies, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now this puts our friend Nick in a very unique place. You see, he is about to ask a question. A question that on the surface sounds a little silly, but yet is very profound. As he thinks, 
about this question. I'm sure he feels like you or I do when we want to ask a question that we feel might be silly. It's sometimes difficult. We feel a little foolish, but yet he asks the question. In fact, Nick says something like this. Uh, how can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born again. You see, Nick was thinking of a physical birth. And well, we have all experienced a physical birth. Most of us do not remember that. Uh, Jesus is talking about a spiritual birth, a spiritual awakening when we accept Jesus as our Savior and believe in him with all our heart. We are, as Jesus says in his word, born again. Yes. You see, on the surface, it sounds like a silly question now, doesn't it? But it is very, very important to our faith. And so that next time, when you feel that a question might be a little silly, and you might be embarrassed to ask it, think of our friend Nick. And maybe, just maybe, great things will happen. Thank you. Good day. All right, and so the Connect kids are released to go downstairs. Sounds like you're going to have a fun time learning about turtle pens and guys named Nick in the Bible. Um, yeah, and so we're just going to continue and worship together. And uh, as we do, I, I just want to share this this prayer from Ephesians chapter 1 with you um, as we just begin to worship together. Let's stand. Um, yeah, and this is just a, just a prayer for us this morning. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. The power, that power, is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, all power and dominion and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way.
The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with ev so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Welcome, Nicodemus. Don't be alarmed. He's waiting for you. I asked the owner of this house for more lanterns, but he said they would draw attention. Yes, I imagine they would. The human eye is drawn to light. We can't help it, it just happens. There are many things we are drawn to without our thinking or our ability to explain why. Thank you for agreeing to meet. Thank you for trying to help Mary when you did no help. You were meant to be there. Me? So I could fail miserably at an exorcism in the Red Quarter? <laughs> if you had not been there that day, would you be on this roof tonight? I don't know where to start. I have so many questions. I... Shall we sit first? Oh, yes. Of course. slums. Hmm. Many wandering preachers have succeeded in gathering crowds with their rhetoric and fiery tone. I've heard a few of them over the years myself. So you know the type. Mm -hmm. But I have never heard anyone tell the paralytic to get up and walk, much less it actually happened. So what is your conclusion? I believe you are not acting alone. No one can do these signs you do without having God in him. Only someone who has come from God. And how is that belief going over in the synagogue? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why we are here at this hour. What else? What have you come here to show us? A kingdom. That is what our rulers are worried about. No, not that kind. Then what? A sort of kingdom that a person cannot see unless he is born again. Born again? Yes. You mean like a new creature? A conversion from Gentile to Jewish? No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Then what is born again? 
I hope you don't mean return to the womb, because that would be a problem for me. My mother, may she rest in peace, is dead. Truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That part of you, that, is what must be reborn to new life. How can these things be? Ah, a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things. Huh? I'm trying, Rabbi. I know. I know. Do you hear this? What? Listen. What do you hear? The wind. How do you know it's the wind? Because I can feel it. And I hear its sound. Do you know where it comes from? No. Do you know where it's going? No. That's what it is to be born again of the Spirit. The Spirit may work in a way that is a mystery to you. And while you cannot see the Spirit, you can recognize His effect. Mind is consumed with thoughts of what a stir these words would cause among the teachers of the law. Yes, and I do not expect otherwise. I speak of what I know and have seen, and it has not been received by the religious leaders. It is hard to receive. So if I have told you of earthly things, and you do not believe, how can I tell you heavenly things? I believe your words. I just fear you may not have a chance to speak many more of them before you are silenced. I have come to do more than speak words, Nicodemus. More miracles? Yes. But even more than that. Do you remember when the children of Israel complained against God and against Moses in the wilderness of Paran? Yes. They wanted to return to Egypt and they cursed the manna that God sent them. And then? They were bitten by serpents. And they were dying. But? But God made a way for them to be healed. Moses lifted the bronze serpent in the desert, and people only needed to look at it. So will the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Our people are not dying from snake bites. They're dying from taxation and oppression. I'm sorry to disappoint you. But I did not come to deliver the people from Rome. Then from what? From sin. From spiritual death. God loves the world in this way. That he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish. But have eternal life. So this has nothing to do with Rome. It's all about... Sin. God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, Nicodemus. He sent him to save it through him. It's as simple as Moses' serpent on the pole. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Have you ever heard anything like this before? Shh. When I met Lilith, Mary, that day, I told my wife and my students I said she was beyond human aid. Only God could have healed her. And then I saw her healed. And here you are. The healer. I my whole life. I have wondered if I would see this day. Follow me, and you'll see more. Follow you? Join me and my students. In two days' time, we leave Capernaum. Come see the kingdom I am bringing into this world. But I... I, I can't. You have a position in the Sanhedrin. 
to have family. You are getting advanced in years. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. But the invitation is still open. The invitation to what exactly? <laughs> to lead a nomadic life, to, to give up who I am. It's true. There is a lot you would give up. But what you would gain is far greater and more lasting. Is this another one of your born-again mysteries? <laughs> Maybe. I know mysteries aren't easy for a scholar. Think about it. Take your time. On the morning of the fifth day, we leave and we'll meet by the well in the southern quarter of the door. Is, is this... Is the kingdom of God really coming? What does your heart tell you? My heart is swollen with fear and he can tell me nothing except that I am standing on holy ground. <laughs> holy roof. <laughs> John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. Did you know it looked like that? Like we know John 3, 16. Like we know that most popular verse in the world. Um, a lot of the things in there we've heard. John chapter 3, we know it. But do you know what it looks like? Do you have a picture of what Jesus encountering people looks like? Do you know what, like the gospel when it encounters a life, when the good, the good news that God is love and has forgiveness and is full of grace and compassion and mercy for people, when God encounters people, it, it looks like that. John chapter 3 is about God encountering Nicodemus and Nicodemus finding Christ and finding a relationship with God that changes everything. Everything about his moment, his heart and his soul and his mind, his thoughts, his view, what he thinks it is all about, everything changes. When, when we find Christ, when a life finds Christ, that's how it looks. I don't know what picture comes to mind when you think of evangelism, but I don't see that picture when I think evangelism. And what we have sometimes make that into. And there, it is evangelism and that's what helping other people find and helping other people follow and multiply the life of Christ in this world. That, that is what that looks like and that is what evangelism is. But it, it's got to come through that kind of heart, through that kind of spirit. I don't think we have enough pictures for what we know that the Bible says. We, we know so much about it. Even if you're brand new to this thing, that you know some things the Bible says, but you haven't pictured the pictures that go with that, that truly reflect the, the heart of God and what it is all about and the difference that it can mean and make for our lives. 
It's pictures that we are short on, not, not knowledge, not knowing. We can go to the Word to know, but we need to go to the Word to know so that we see the pictures of what our life is supposed to look like and what God's love in it is supposed to look like and what that love overflowing to others is supposed to look like. Today we're talking about living lives that reach for others. That's, that, and that's a picture of what it, it's supposed to look like in our lives as God reaches others uh, through, our, through our lives and through our relationships. That's got to be the picture that we have in a mind. Each of us and the lives that we see around us and that see us around them. And then collectively, like as a church, as a, as a body of people or a known people in this community that goes under this little umbrella of a live church that it, it, it's got to be known that we got to hold a picture that that's what we look like, full of grace and mercy and compassion. And when we encounter people with the truth, that it's this Nicodemus and Jesus-like encounter is what we have to be picturing in our heads so that we more accurately live out the life that God calls us to. We're on the, the kind of the last teaching week of a series where we've been doing that same thing with a passage out of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2. You should know that. If you're new around here, that's where you should start reading. Check that out. We believe verses 41 through 47 of chapter 2 in the book of Acts is like this picture. It, it, it's information in a sense because it's text on a page, but if you read it, you, you see a picture of what lives that live for God live for him and serve him with their life and, and want to step into the space of representing what life was created to be like in this world. We see that in that book of Acts and there's supposed to be pictures of what when lives find Christ and how they band together and become devoted to the word and prayer and to worship and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to prayer, awe and wonder happening in their lives as they encounter Christ like we just saw, a life encountering Christ they meet together in homes, they break bread, they have sincere hearts, they give to everyone who has need. It's like life on life, new purpose, new transformation. And the passage that we, the verse that we kind of focus in this week on, out of that is verse 47, where it says, in praising God and enjoying all the favor of the people, God added to their number daily those who were being saved. Daily, those who were being reached, and they were being reached because of the favor, like the positive view that people had of them because of the life they were leading and how they were leading it. Like it was an attractive thing. It was a contagious thing. It gained favor because what they were seeing this group of people live like and live as was not was not visible in other lives and in other pockets or other places. This was something different the way that these lives were leading and the way that these lives were living. That's this Acts 2 picture that we're talking about. It's supposed to be the greatest show on earth. Not the circus, not a three-ring circus, but this reality of an Acts 2 community where lives that are living out the great commandment, loving God with all their heart, all their soul, with all their mind and all their strength, and then loving their neighbor as themselves. And then they're committed to carrying out the Great Commission. Going, making disciples, baptizing lives, teaching them to obey everything God has commanded. To live that life that he calls us into is, is the picture that we're shooting for. Around here we call that, that would be like the biblically functioning body of Christ. Our lives live in the way that God has designed and calls us to live our words for those same phrases, the great commandment, we say that we want to chase God, love people, and reach for Chicagoland with the life of Christ. That's a great commandment life. And the great commission is we, we want to help others find and follow and multiply the life of Christ in this world because then that's how the kingdom comes. That's how God's redemptive will unfolds in this world. And so today we're focusing on reaching the last three weeks, we focused on worship, which is this like totally surrendering God and committing to living his way, 
to growing, which come, you know, makes the word and prayer central in our lives. Reading God's word, letting it give us pictures of our lives and who we are and who we're made to be and God's love and who he is, who he is and what he is like and why he is worthy of all of our chase in this life. And then love, so worship and grow, and then love where we band together and we serve other people. And this week, this reaching thing is how we share our faith and multiply the life of Christ in this world. And I just, I guess I can make it real personal and just honestly, I don't know how to do that really well in my life. I don't think I share my faith really well in my life. I don't think I multiply Christ's life. I think I mess it up. And yet I think pictures like this John chapter 3 verses 1 through 3 to want it to be more like that full of grace and compassion and about a story and about a life that's you know living and going after that life that's living or actually a life that's not quite fully alive and trying to help that life come fully alive like Jesus was doing with Nicodemus is so important so central So the word that we're teaching is just that passage out of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. But I just want to make some like observations or some thoughts that I was having that would help me more authentically be someone who is reaching for others, that can share my faith in an authentic way, that can multiply Christ's life without becoming religious or weird, that ends up repelling someone actually from God's love and his goodness and what life is meant to be as we live it out the way he calls us to. But again, just crying out for a more accurate picture that each of us could then gain, but then collectively too, we could, could view ourselves differently as, as to what we are as the church, what we are to be as the church in this world. So here, here's some just truths from that, that passage, some observations. The first one is Nicodemus knew of Jesus and he had been watching his life. Like you can see from just that conversation in the words of John chapter 3, you can see Nicodemus knew and had been watching, knew that where Jesus went, other people had to go. Crowds were attracted to where Jesus showed up because lives tended to be changed. And it would also often be like those lives that would change that would go tell people how their life just got changed that would then cause those people who are looking for that same kind of life change to start to show up. And then when they would show up, like it was Jesus' teachings that he was known for. But again, they, and they were teachings of like God's word, but they were pictures. He was telling people about the kingdom, how they could be living right now, that the kingdom has come, it's here and it's yet to come. Everything we were created for, the love and the peace of God in our lives, like th that's here. And he was teaching things to help people get that it wasn't about Rome and the things of this world, but like the kingdom of God. That's something that's far more like the wind than a block of concrete. It has mystery, but it's all about like your spirit and what's inside of you and that God is inside of you and you're to be inside of him. Nicodemus knew and like all this was blowing his mind like who is this who is this guy people go to hear him when they go to hear him they're changed when they're changed they go tell others and then they come it's like a crazy story and it's starting to happen everywhere he knew of them so in a sense Jesus was leading like this kind of noticeable life where he went and what happened where he went, who he gathered with. He became known for who he went to, like in that community or in that society and in that culture, who he drifted towards and had most compassion, really wanted to express his love and mercy to the marginalized, the vulnerable, the poor, the broken, the outcast. Like that was driving Nicodemus nuts. Why did he keep doing that? But all he could do is keep noticing that that's what Jesus did. He lived this noticeable life because he was doing the will of God and he was about his kingdom. And I feel like, man, that's our starting point is our life noticeable, not so that we get noticed, but noticeable because of how accurate we live out what God calls us to live out, a compassionate life full of mercy that goes towards brokenness and hurt and pain 
and lostness and confusion and religion that's messed up. Do I do, I do that? That's like sharing your faith. Sharing your faith is like living it out every day. While you get up, you, you have faith every move you make throughout the day, or you ought to. It should be an expression of what you believe is most important in the life you are leading, and therefore the choices you make and where you go and who you're with and who you're not with and where you don't go. Like it would all make sense under that filter. And that would be observable. Does my life offer anything different than everyone else in the, in the room or in the world or in the community? Do I offer an alternative that's any better than Facebook or what the world's dis- dishing out for hope and love and life and belonging and significance and purpose? Is there, would any, you know, is there any sense that there's anything about those things going on in me and the life I'm leading and what I'm living for? It ought to be if we're, we're, if we're chasing God, loving people, and reaching for Chicago and living out that great commandment. It seems like that would be unfolding. First Peter 2, 9 and 10 says this, But you are a chosen people. This is anyone following Christ. This verse applies to you as it's stated. You are a chosen people. You're a part of a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You are God's special possession. Don't you think if you live like that, that would be something those around you would observe being different than just Phil, just Phil, just trying to figure it out, just pretty messed up? That's part of it. But then what am I shooting for? What am I aiming at? Where have I come from? Where am I going? I love how the King James Version puts it, a peculiar people. And that, that's that side that, yeah, it, it will be different. Not weird, though. Like, not weird to the humanity and the human condition that we're all made with. To other humans, it would make sense. Weird in, like, religion. Weird religiously because we're making it, you know, something far from what God ever intended for it to be. But, like, a peculiar people because why you move the way you move. who you move the way you move and who you move among and what's at the center of it all, that ought to, that ought to stand out and separate and, and, again, cause others to be probably watching your life if you were watching. I think God's on the move in our body in ways that's, in one sense, very hard to see. Church in America if you're a church, it's all about Sunday morning and, and it's all about how many people are coming, how many seats. I think it's sometimes called how many nickels and noses, how much money is coming in the offering and how many noses are in the seats, nickels and noses. That's just religion. That's just religious services. That's just being good at religious services, which are things you repeat and grow. And those, those can be good and are not a problem, but if you're not seeing what God is doing and you're all hung up on that, then that is a problem. One of the cool things God is doing, I think, around here is making us kind of that noticeable. He's doing things that we didn't even plan that make it noticeable in the community. Us partnering with Almost Home. I can't tell you how many people have noticed that, that a church would do that, just give space to an organization helping the homeless. I'm like, how in the world wouldn't we? Like, what, <laughs> what moronic pastor would say no to that if th- we got space and they want to come? You say yes to that, but what's crazy is that how many people notice that we did that and therefore like, yeah, that's awesome. What's going on with that? We do the church under the bridge thing, and that's a lot because being willing to say yes to that, that led to the church under the bridge, and that has become such a noticeable thing. Not we, and we didn't do it to get noticed. It was like something God did. We didn't even plan it. But this almost home connection and then church under the bridge and then AA meetings and then hero, heroin, addict recovery meetings taking place, partnering with another church uh, that uses this building and it's hard to kind of maybe tell the two churches apart with what's going on. And so, who cares? Who cares doesn't really matter other than it just seems to kind of be this noticeable expression of like, man, that, that's, that's like kind of a cool thing. Too many times churches, we're just known for our religious services. 
and we operate and we exist for our religious services just to keep those going versus truly following the Spirit of God and how he's moving. I hope that makes some sense. Each of us trying to, to live that full life that God calls us to, fully human in the sense of made in his image, living out the life he's purposed and impassioned us for, if we go after that, that ought to stand out. And then if we come together for that same kind of intent, collectively things would start to happen that would be pretty sweet because they would be God things. The second thing then, if Nicodemus knew Jesus and had been watching his life, this inverse was true as well. Jesus knew Nicodemus, and he was watching, and he knew Nicodemus' story. That you, you can just see in the conversation and what was being worded, and it probably could be somewhat categorical because Nicodemus is a Pharisee and how Jesus knows Pharisees, but there's something also personable, uh, personal about the, the heart of Nicodemus and what Jesus sees taking place and what he knows in there. Jesus knew that he, uh, what he wanted to say to Nicodemus out of the grace and the mercy and the compassion that he had and felt for Nicodemus in the life, and kind of this life that Nicodemus was trapped in. He had some headspace issues that he couldn't get through to figure out what this life that God calls him into is really all about. And again, this is back to like reaching Nicodemus. He wasn't trying to help him know he was going to go to heaven when he dies. That, that wasn't the conversation. The conversation was right about the immediate. He's trying to rescue him in this sincere life that he wanted to lead, but he had blockage, couldn't see it, had religious things sitting in the way of him being able to find that life, and yet his heart wanted to come fully alive, but just didn't have a way to do that. That's the conversation Jesus was having with him, was trying to rescue him in the sincerity of his heart and help him come to life in that. What Nicodemus needed was to be saved. Saved from like that mind trap that he was in that religious, religion had kind of bent him into. He needed saved from his religion. And that just got me thinking, I don't really like the word saved because I, I had the Catholic upbringing and then that evangelism thing and being saved. I'm like, I'm about finding Christ. I'm about following Christ. I'm about God's redemptive work. And yeah, I get... Saving does make sense, but not all the time. But the way I was, the, however this hit me this week, I was like, man, it is, it is a saving kind of deal. Nicodemus needs to be saved from the religion. People need to be saved from that. There's a lot of religious people that aren't alive in Christ, and Christ is not alive in them. That's horrible. That's a horrible life to lead. They need rescue from that. So that I just got on this list like of things people need saved from. Probably me in the front of that line. Saved from religion. Saved from lostness. Just like they're looking. They are looking everywhere to make sense of life and what's going on and what's not going on and taking place. But they're just lost. There's not plumb lines and horizons to make sense of where they're at. The life that has happened to them and what's happened in their life they're, they're lost. They need to be saved from that. There needs to be a conversation full of grace and compassion and mercy and a life and get underneath that story and what has happened and value them. Give them dignity and value and, and purpose. Let them know they're loved as a child of God. Come into that space. They need saved in that way. They need to be saved from self. So much self-reliance. So much self-centeredness. So much self-condemnation. All those things in the way of people knowing God and his love and grace and mercy just moving into your life. People need saved from addiction. I love AA and that, that can happen in this space and that's a part of our family and body. People getting free, being saved from that. Saved from anger, saved from purposelessness, saved from loneliness, saved from pain, whether it's physical, relational, or emotional pain. Do you know how much pain people are living in all the time. Not if we don't slow down and know a name and know a story and make room for the heart of God to fill up in us and have the compassion and mercy and concern for another. 
We need, so many people need to be saved from bitterness, from resentment, from idolatry, chasing the wrong thing, even getting it, but it's going to be emptiness. And ultimately, like Jesus says to Nicodemus, ultimately it is saved from sin, but sin is anything that separates us from God's love and forgiveness and goodness being realized and experienced in our life. That relationship being broke or there being a void in it, that gap has to be closed. And so it's not just just leading this life that's noticeable, it's leading a life that notices others and like their story, making time for people, realizing who God puts in your path and maybe their story and how you could intersect that and join them in it. Jesus reached for Nicodemus to close the gap between him and God. And it wasn't just him and God, but it's him and God and God's love and the forgiveness, the freedom that comes, the healing that comes, the restoration that comes, the transformation that comes. That was what was breaking Jesus' heart, that Nicodemus couldn't be in that kind of space. Here's how Jesus did that. He lived a noticeable life just because of being faithful to following God and living authentically the life God called him to. You will be noticeable if you do that. He noticed Nicodemus. He knew his name. He knew his story. He spoke to his heart, and his heart was the concern of the matter. And sharing the gospel and the good news of God's love is, what he, is how he did that. And lastly, he gave him then that invitation at the end to like be all in with your life. This isn't a one-time decision that changes eternity. It's a one-time decision that starts a journey for all of eternity. But be, be in that. Be in that space of following me. Drop it all. Come after me. Is, is your life noticeable? And are you noticing other lives around you? Are we as a body, are we as a church, are, are we noticeable and are we noticing the needs around us or are we just religious and about our religious services? Man, does that smell bad. John twenty twenty one. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. It's in a, a room like this. A small number, eyeball to eyeball, Jesus saying, those who follow him, you got to be me. You got to be me. You got to be my body. This world needs me. I need you to be me. And that's not just know the things that are like in the Bible or just know all these things for your life and once you're okay, you just keep all those things and then you live like the world lives but you know those things and you think that makes a difference eternally. That does not. No, you be me. You live like I lived. You follow me with your life and how you live. One last list. And I feel like, man, it's not this, this call to live this life that reaches. Um, it's in every one of us. It's like we're made in the image of God. That's clearer in God's word. We're made in his image. It's inside of us to live like this. And in that sense, God made us human. So to be the, the full humanity or the full human that God made us to be, we were created, everyone was created to live noticed and noticing lives. That's, that's when you love life. That's why you love life when that's kind of happening because it's supposed to be our story, but it's our story for God. It's not our story for us. You're not getting noticed for you and you're not noticing others for you other than we usually are, but it's not supposed, you're, it, that's all for God because we, we were created for his glory which is to know him and make him known. 
That's why our life aches to live like this. And this isn't if you follow Christ or not. It's if you're made by God, which every human being is, it's inside of you to try to find this life, to know him and to make him known, to be noticed and to be noticing. That's not religious. This is not religious training for evangelism's sake. This is life training to live the life that God calls us up and into and to live that out. And we need saved from anything that keeps us from doing that. That's brokenness. That's woundedness. That's shatteredness. That's vandalism of what God created us for and how we were made to live. So this list isn't like to be a good Christian. to do. This is like to be fully alive in who God has made you to be. And it's so true for you that it's true for everyone. So there's an ache within us to, to help others know this and go after this. I feel like this is what Jesus was doing with his time. Number one, he was a positive presence. There was, there was something good about being around him. Even though he talked about hard stuff, there was a heart and a, a soul and a mind behind it that it was positive. People showed up. He actually tried to get away from people far more than he tried to get people to come be around him. It was because he was this positive presence. Verbally kind and generous. Be like that. Be positive presence. Be verbally kind and generous. Know and use people's names. Names are a huge piece of our identity. We were made to be known and to know. We were made to know God, make him known. His image is inside of us. We are like that. It is in us to be loved and to belong, to be known and to be knowing. Use a name. That's a person. Love them by discovering their story. Like take forever to get to know them. Who are they? How are they made? What are they passionate about? What's happened to them? What do they dream about? What are they living for? That's all in a story. Love them by honoring the story they, they've lived before them. There wasn't a time where Jesus was like holding up a bar and distancing himself and thinking he wasn't going to close the gate. He was for him that whole time. Be transparent. Be humble. Don't try to make points and be right. In that, like, did you see how Jesus just was so truthful and honest but questions and left things out there to be considered? No spiritual abuse was taking place. Have true conversations. Just meet with people at a time and in a space and be with them. Let the Holy Spirit lead the conversation. Find common ground. Allow mutual conclusions as you're thinking and exploring. Value their identity, their dignity, and their purpose. That's th they're a child of God. He made them and loves them unconditionally. Treat them like that. They're made in his image and have infinite worth. Treat them like that. And their purpose, man, everything about them and everything they do matters to God. You better honor that. They're his child. Their value is from him and their purpose is we need to approach it like that. Give an invitation to come into a story, into your story, or into the, the story of following Jesus and leave with expectancy the next uh, leave with expectancy of the next time that you will talk and be together. He didn't leave Nicodemus on there. It was tough and man, what a hard road. If you've not checking, uh, have not seen Chosen, um, it's a binge watching uh, offering of Jesus' life. Yeah, check it out. It's amazing how it brings God's word to life and gives us pictures then to chase after, not just information or things that we know. He left Nicodemus with this expectancy of another time if he's going to be all in. Man, to live like that, who doesn't want to live like that? Again, based on personalities and styles and stories, it's going to look different from each person, but that's the drive. 
That's the drive that's underneath all of it that I think is best summed up in like that, that heart of God. His compassion, his love, his mercy, his grace, his truth always coming after us. Always wanting to flow out of us to others so that his way continues to happen. So as the worship team comes up, we're going to close out just with one more song. Hopefully, more than anything, this leads to conversations, talking about, talking about this stuff with one another and with others, not just being hearers of, of, a, of a message or hearers of God's word and then go away and be the same, that we'd really be different from just great conversations about our, our lives, our stories, what God's up into them, and how we can keep leading and following him. Um, this, I believe, is just a way of um, marking this moment for some of us, for, for choosing to, to live this life that's made fully alive in Christ, this noticeable, different way of living life. So I just would invite you to stand and sing with us. And if that's, that's you, that this is a moment for you choosing that kind of life, I just would invite you even just to come, come forward, just come up to the front. And we'll pray with you.
today, but let's go out to where the real playing field is, which is every other moment of our life, to live differently based on how God was just leading and prompting and calling us, and let's, that, let's do that together as a body. So thanks so much. You are sent out from here.